Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to the people who stumbled upon my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for coming to my YouTube channel. Are you fascinated by criminal stories? Welcome to the Dark and Twisted channel, where we explore the dark side of crime. From missing persons to high profile murder cases, we provide up to date information about criminal activity happening around the world. And if you like this content, please don't forget to press the subscribe button. And don't forget to hit the notification bell too so you can get an update when I upload new videos. I upload videos three times a week. Thank you very much, and always take care. Lisa Marie Young was born on May 5, 1981 in Nanaimo, British Columbia. A healthy and beautiful baby with long eyelashes. Her hair was dark and kind of curly. Like her father's. Lisa Marie Young was the eldest child and only daughter of Don Young and Marlene Joanne Martin. She has two younger brothers, Brian and Robin. Growing up in Nanaimo, she attended Brecon Elementary and Woodland Secondary School. Lisa's maternal grandfather, Martin's father, Moses Martin, is tribal chief of the Tla'okia First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Joanne and both of her parents, Moses and Cecilia, attended Kakawas Residential School on nearby Mears Island. Lisa was close with her family. Martin described her as an independent woman who was a hard worker with a hard head and had inner strength that was totally awesome. Dallas Hulley, friend of Lisa and the last person to hear from her, described Lisa as outgoing, confident, bubbly, and said she was somebody you noticed right away, at a party or a gathering, or whatever it was. She just had a light about her. Lisa was a vegetarian and a fitness enthusiast and enjoyed rollerblading at the waterfront. She and her roommate lived next door to her parents in a Barron's Road apartment building. But at the time of Lisa's disappearance, her father was helping her move into her own apartment in northern Nanaimo. Something she was excited about. Lisa was also preparing to start a job at a call center within two days of her disappearance and considering pursuing higher education with the hopes of becoming a television sports broadcaster. On the evening of June 29, 2002, Lisa Marie Young's parents said goodbye to their 21-year-old daughter as she headed out for a night of clubbing with friends in Nanaimo, British Columbia. It was the Canada Day long weekend, so the downtown core was lively and full of revelers. Lisa met up with a group of friends at the Jungle Nightclub, later called Club 241. At around 2.30 a.m. on June 30, Lisa and her friends left the bar with a man they had just met, 27-year-old Christopher Adair. Adair offered to give them all a ride to a house party in his Red Jaguar. After spending some time there, the group then left again with Adair and headed to another party. At the second house party, which was located in the Cathars Lake area of Nanaimo, Lisa mentioned that she needed to go get some food. Lisa, a vegetarian, could not find any options at the party that suited her dietary needs. Adair offered to drive Lisa to a local sandwich shop to grab what she needed. Lisa accepted Adair's offer and they left the party alone in his vehicle around 3 a.m. Lisa texted one of her friends who she had been partying with that night, Dallas Hulley, at around 4.30 a.m. In the message, Lisa explained that Adair did not drive her to pick up food like he had promised. Instead, he had taken her to another house party. Lisa was becoming concerned for her safety and did not feel as though she was allowed to leave. When Lisa disappeared, she was 5 feet and 4 inch tall, 163 centimeters, and 115 pounds, 52 kilograms. She had long dark brown hair, brown eyes, and a tattoo on her right arm of a band of flowers with a heart in the middle.
Christopher was questioned by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, later that year. He was previously charged with assault, fraud, and theft in Kamloops, British Columbia and unauthorized use of credit cards in Edmonton, Alberta. Christopher was also charged with assaulting a police officer in Yorkton, Saskatchewan after Lisa's disappearance. Joanne met Christopher at an RCMP detachment. They spoke in a small room with a large picture of Lisa and the words accident, murder, and rape, written on a whiteboard. Christopher claimed to have dropped Lisa off and she planned on calling a taxi. Despite no record of that, when Joanne asked if he could tell her where Lisa was, he responded with, I can't. I'm sorry. I don't mean to disrespect your family. The RCMP refuses to confirm the legitimacy of this conversation. Alison Crowe's website implies that Christopher passed a polygraph test. Geraldine Adair, Christopher's grandmother and the owner of the Jaguar vehicle, sold the car and threatened to take legal actions if her grandson was implicated any more in Lisa's disappearance. She died in 2011. Joanne died of liver failure at 54 years old on June 21, 2017. She was also suffering from hypertension, taking dialysis, and on a waiting list for a kidney transplant. Her family believes she had become sick from the stress of losing Lisa. Carol Frank, Joanne's sister, revealed that Joanne tried to hide Lisa's First Nations ancestry. She worried about people assuming Lisa was a sex worker, living on the streets, an alcoholic, or using drugs. Carol has also said that the RCMP took months to follow up on tips and the Tla Oki at First Nation was searching before them. Dallas died after being struck by a vehicle on the early morning of March 25, 2018. He and a friend were walking along a highway where he walked out onto the road to retrieve something. The driver that hit Dallas was going 10 kilometers under the speed limit, but she was unable to see him due to his unreflective clothing. In January 2020, Lisa and another missing indigenous woman from Vancouver Island were featured on electronic billboards along the island highway. The Lil Red Dress Project paid $7,000 to keep their spots up for four months. During December 2020, RCMP officers performed a search in Morel Sanctuary and two searches on an Nanaimo Lakes Road property in relation to Lisa's disappearance. The property owners, who bought it in 2003, did not know the RCMP wanted to search it until earlier that month. An anonymous neighbor said he saw a body on a hammock in the backyard when Lisa went missing. Not long after, he also saw equipment moving soil around in the backyard. This sighting was passed on to police at the time. Thankfully, unlike many other cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada, Lisa's case has received adequate press coverage. A black mark on Canada is, without doubt, our horrific treatment of indigenous peoples. In part to combat the systemic racism that hinders closure in cases involving indigenous women and girls, the Canadian federal government formed the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. CBC News, Canada's largest news outlet, has also focused on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls by starting an excellent and informative website that investigates their cases. Lisa was a fiery, independent young woman who enjoyed water sports, rollerblading, and spending time with her friends. Her mother, Joanne, has reminisced how Lisa was a hard worker and had a hard head. Sadly, Lisa's mother passed away in 2017 without knowing what happened to her daughter. However, Lisa still has loved ones who will not give up searching for answers.